Charles John Huffam Dickens Deacons, 7 February 1812 to the 9th of June 1870, was an English writer and social critic. He created some of the world's best-known fictional characters and is regarded by many as the greatest novelist of the Victorian era. His works enjoyed unprecedented popularity during his lifetime and, by the 20th century, critics and scholars had recognized him as a literary genius. His novels and short stories are widely read today. Born in Portsmouth, Dickens left school at the age of 12 to work in a boot-blacking factory when his father was incarcerated in a debtor's prison. After three years he returned to school, before he began his literary career as a journalist. Dickens edited a weekly journal for 20 years, wrote 15 novels, 5 novellas, hundreds of short stories and nonfiction articles, lectured and performed readings extensively, was an indefatigable letter writer, and campaigned vigorously for children's rights, for education, and for other social reforms. Dickens's literary success began with the 1836 serial publication of the Pickwick Papers, a publishing phenomenon, thanks largely to the introduction of the character Sam Weller in the fourth episode, that sparked Pickwick merchandise and spin-offs. Within a few years Dickens had become an international literary celebrity, famous for his humor, satire and keen observation of character and society. His novels, most of them published in monthly or weekly installments, pioneered the serial publication of narrative fiction, which became the dominant Victorian mode for novel publication. Cliffhanger endings in his serial publications kept readers in suspense. The installment format allowed Dickens to evaluate his audience's reaction, and he often modified his plot and character development based on such feedback. For example, when his wife's chiropodist expressed distress at the way Miss Mocher and David Copperfield seemed to reflect her own disabilities, Dickens improved the character with positive features. His plots were carefully constructed and he often wove elements from topical events into his narratives. Masses of the illiterate poor would individually pay a halfpenny to have each new monthly episode read to them, opening up and inspiring a new class of readers. His 1843 novella A Christmas Carol remains especially popular and continues to inspire adaptations in every artistic genre. Oliver Twist and Great Expectations are also frequently adapted and, like many of his novels, evoke images of early Victorian London. His 1859 novel A Tale of Two Cities, set in London and Paris, is his best-known work of historical fiction. The most famous celebrity of his era, he undertook, in response to public demand, a series of public reading tours in the later part of his career. The term Dickensian is used to describe something that is reminiscent of Dickens and his writings, such as poor social or working conditions, or comically repulsive characters. Charles Dickens was born on 7 February 1812 at One Mile End Terrace now 393 Commercial Road, Landport in Portsea Island, Portsmouth, Hampshire, the second of eight children of Elizabeth Dickens née Barrow, 1789-1863, and John Dickens, 1785-1851. His father was a clerk in the Navy Pay Office and was temporarily stationed in the district. He asked Christopher Puffham, 14, rigor to His Majesty's Navy, gentleman, and head of an established firm, to act as godfather to Charles. Puffham is thought to be the inspiration for Paul Dombey, the owner of a shipping company in Dickens's novel Dombey and Son, 1848. In January 1815, John Dickens was called back to London and the family moved to Norfolk Street, Fitzrovia. When Charles was four, they relocated to Sheerness and thence to Chatham, Kent, where he spent his formative years until the age of 11. His early life seems to have been idyllic, though he thought himself a very small and not over particularly taken care of boy. Charles spent time outdoors, but also read voraciously, including the picaresque novels of Tobias Smollett and Henry Fielding, as well as Robinson Crusoe and Gil Bloss. He read and reread The Arabian Nights and the collected farces of Elizabeth Inchbald. At age seven he first saw Joseph Grimaldi, the father of modern clowning, perform at the Star Theatre, Rochester. He later imitated Grimaldi's clowning on several occasions, and would also edit the memoirs of Joseph Grimaldi. He retained poignant memories of childhood, helped by an excellent memory of people and events, which he used in his writing. His father's brief work as a clerk in the Navy Pay Office afforded him a few years of private education, first at a dame school and then at a school run by William Giles, a dissenter, in Chatham. This period came to an end in June 1822, when John Dickens was recalled to Navy Pay Office headquarters at Somerset House and the family, except for Charles, 
who stayed behind to finish his final term at school, moved to Camden Town in London. The family had left Kent amidst rapidly mounting debts and, living beyond his means, John Dickens was forced by his creditors into the Marshalsea Debtors Prison in Southwark, London in 1824. His wife and youngest children joined him there, as was the practice at the time. Charles, then 12 years old, boarded with Elizabeth Roylance, a family friend, at 112 College Place, Camden Town. Mrs. Roylance was, a reduced impoverished old lady, long known to our family, whom Dickens later immortalized, with a few alterations and embellishments, as, Mrs. Pipchin, in Dombey and Son. Later, he lived in a back attic in the house of an agent for the insolvent court, Archibald Russell, a fat, good-natured, kind old gentleman, with a quiet old wife, and lame son, in Lance Street in Southwark. They provided the inspiration for the garlands in the old curiosity shop. On Sundays with his sister Frances, free from her studies at the Royal Academy of Music he spent the day at the Marshalsea. Dickens later used the prison as a setting in Little Dorrit. To pay for his board and to help his family, Dickens was forced to leave school and work ten-hour days at Warren's Blacking Warehouse, on Hungerford Stairs, near the present Charing Cross Railway Station, where he earned six shillings a week pasting labels on pots of boot blacking. The strenuous and often harsh working conditions made a lasting impression on Dickens and later influenced his fiction and essays, becoming the foundation of his interest in the reform of socio-economic and labor conditions, the rigors of which he believed were unfairly borne by the poor. He later wrote that he wondered, how I could have been so easily cast away at such an age. Wentworth Warehouse was moved to Chondos Street in the smart, busy district of Covent Garden, the boys worked in a room in which the window gave onto the street. Small audiences gathered and watched them at work in Dickens's biographer Simon Callow's estimation, the public display was, a new refinement added to his misery. A few months after his imprisonment, John Dickens's mother, Elizabeth Dickens, died and bequeathed him 450 pounds. On the expectation of this legacy, Dickens was released from prison. Under the Insolvent Debtors Act, Dickens arranged for payment of his creditors and he and his family left the Marshalsea, 33, for the home of Mrs. Roylance. Charles's mother, Elizabeth Dickens, did not immediately support his removal from the bootblacking warehouse. This influenced Dickens's view that a father should rule the family and a mother find her proper sphere inside the home. I never afterwards forgot, I never shall forget, I never can forget, that my mother was warm for my being sent back. His mother's failure to request his return was a factor in his dissatisfied attitude towards women. Righteous indignation stemming from his own situation and the conditions under which working-class people lived became major themes of his works, and it was this unhappy period in his youth to which he alluded in his favorite, and most autobiographical, novel, David Copperfield, I had no advice, no counsel, no encouragement, no consolation, no assistance, no support, of any kind, from anyone, that I can call to mind, as I hope to go to heaven. Dickens was eventually sent to the Wellington House Academy in Camden Town, where he remained until March 1827, having spent about two years there. He did not consider it to be a good school. Much of the haphazard, desultory teaching, poor discipline punctuated by the headmaster's sadistic brutality, the seedy ushers and general run-down atmosphere, are embodied in Mr. Creakle's establishment in David Copperfield. Dickens worked at the law office of Ellis and Blackmore, attorneys, of Holborn Court, Gray's Inn, as a junior clerk from May 1827 to November 1828. He was a gifted mimic and impersonated those around him, clients, lawyers and clerks. He went to theaters obsessively. He claimed that for at least three years he went to the theater every day. His favorite actor was Charles Matthews and Dickens learned his, Monopoly Logs, farces in which Matthews played every character, by heart. Then, having learned Gurney's system of shorthand in his spare time, he left to become a freelance reporter. A distant relative, Thomas Charlton, was a freelance reporter at Doctors Commons and Dickens was able to share his box there to report the legal proceedings for nearly four years. This education was to inform works such as Nicholas Nickleby, Dombey and Son and especially Bleak House, whose vivid portrayal of the machinations and bureaucracy of the legal system did much to enlighten the general public and served as a vehicle for dissemination of Dickens's own views regarding, particularly, the heavy burden on the poor who were forced by circumstances to, go to law. In 1830, Dickens met his first love, Maria Beadnell, thought to have been the model for the character Dora in David Copperfield. 
Maria's parents disapproved of the courtship and ended the relationship by sending her to school in Paris. In 1832, at the age of 20, Dickens was energetic and increasingly self-confident. 41. He enjoyed mimicry and popular entertainment, lacked a clear, specific sense of what he wanted to become, and yet knew he wanted fame. Drawn to the theater he became an early member of the Garrick Club. 42. He landed an acting audition at Covent Garden, where the manager George Bartley and the actor Charles Kemble were to see him. Dickens prepared meticulously and decided to imitate the comedian Charles Matthews, but ultimately he missed the audition because of a cold. Before another opportunity arose, he had set out on his career as a writer. 43. In 1833, Dickens submitted his first story, A Dinner at Poplar Walk, to the London Periodical Monthly Magazine. 44. William Barrow, Dickens's uncle on his mother's side, offered him a job on the Mirror of Parliament and he worked in the House of Commons for the first time early in 1832. He rented rooms at Furnival's Inn and worked as a political journalist, reporting on parliamentary debates, and he travelled across Britain to cover election campaigns for the Morning Chronicle. His journalism, in the form of sketches in periodicals, formed his first collection of pieces, published in 1836, sketches by Boz Boz being a family nickname he employed as a pseudonym for some years. Dickens apparently adopted it from the nickname, Moses, which he had given to his youngest brother Augustus Dickens, after a character in Oliver Goldsmith's The Vicar of Wakefield. When pronounced by anyone with a head cold, Moses, became, Bozes, later shortened to Boz. Dickens's own name was considered, queer, by a contemporary critic, who wrote in 1849, Mr. Dickens, as if in revenge for his own queer name, does bestow still queerer ones upon his fictitious creations. Dickens contributed to and edited journals throughout his literary career. In January 1835, the Morning Chronicle launched an evening edition, under the editorship of the Chronicle's music critic, George Hogarth. Hogarth invited him to contribute street sketches and Dickens became a regular visitor to his Fulham house excited by Hogarth's friendship with Walter Scott, whom Dickens greatly admired, and enjoying the company of Hogarth's three daughters, Georgina, Mary and 19-year-old Catherine. Dickens's approach to the novel is influenced by various things, including the picaresque novel tradition, melodrama and the novel of sensibility. According to Ackroyd, other than these, perhaps the most important literary influence on him was derived from the fables of the Arabian Nights. Satire and irony are central to the picaresque novel. Comedy is also an aspect of the British picaresque novel tradition of Lawrence Stern, Henry Fielding and Tobias Smollett. Fielding's Tom Jones was a major influence on the 19th century novelist including Dickens, who read it in his youth and named a son Henry Fielding Dickens after him. Influenced by Gothic fiction, a literary genre that began with The Castle of Otranto 1764, by Horace Walpole, Dickens incorporated Gothic imagery, settings and plot devices in his works. Victorian Gothic moved from castles and abbeys into contemporary urban environments, in particular London, such as Dickens's Oliver Twist and Bleak House. The Jilted Bride Miss Havisham from Great Expectations is one of Dickens's best-known Gothic creations, living in a ruined mansion, her bridal gown effectively doubles as her funeral shroud. Neither writer had such a profound influence on Dickens as William Shakespeare. On Dickens's veneration of Shakespeare, Alfred Harbage wrote, No one is better qualified to recognize literary genius than a literary genius, a kind of power, the Shakespeare-Dickens analogy, 1975. Regarding Shakespeare as, the great master, whose plays, were an unspeakable source of delight, Dickens's lifelong affinity with the playwright included seeing theatrical productions of his plays in London and putting on amateur dramatics with friends in his early years. In 1838 Dickens traveled to Stratford-upon-Avon and visited the house in which Shakespeare was born, leaving his autograph in the visitor's book. Dickens would draw on this experience in his next work, Nicholas Nickleby 1838-39, expressing the strength of feeling experienced by visitors to Shakespeare's birthplace. The character Mrs. Wittitterly states, I don't know how it is, but after you've seen the place and written your name in the little book, somehow or other you seem to be inspired, it kindles up quite a fire within one. Dickens's biographer Claire Tomalin regards him as the greatest creator of character in English fiction after Shakespeare. Dickensian characters are amongst the most memorable in English literature, especially so because of their typically whimsical names. The likes of Ebenezer Scrooge, Tiny Tim, Jacob Marley and Bob Cratchit, A Christmas Carol, Oliver Twist, The Artful Dodger, 
Fagan and Bill Sykes Oliver Twist Pip, Miss Havisham and Abel Magwitch Great Expectations, Sidney Carden, Charles Darnay and Madame Defarge, A Tale of Two Cities. David Copperfield, Uriah Heep and Mr. Micawber, David Copperfield, Daniel Quilp and Nell Trent, The Old Curiosity Shop, Samuel Pickwick and Sam Weller, The Pickwick Papers, and Wackford Squeers, Nicholas Nickleby, are so well known as to be part and parcel of popular culture, and in some cases have passed into ordinary language. A Scrooge, for example, is a miser or someone who dislikes Christmas festivity. His characters were often so memorable that they took on a life of their own outside his books. Gamp became a slang expression for an umbrella from the character Mrs. Gamp, and Pickwickian, Pecksniffian, and Gradgrind all entered dictionaries due to Dickens's original portraits of such characters who were, respectively, quixotic, hypocritical and vapidly factual. The character that made Dickens famous, Sam Weller became known for his Wellerisms, onliners that turned proverbs on their heads. Many were drawn from real life. Mrs. Nickleby is based on his mother, although she didn't recognize herself in the portrait, just as Mr. Micawber is constructed from aspects of his father's rhetorical exuberance, Harold Skimpole in Bleak House is based on James Henry Lee Hunt, his wife's dwarfish chiropodist recognized herself in Miss Mocher in David Copperfield, perhaps Dickens's impressions on his meeting with Hans Christian Andersen informed the delineation of Uriah Heep, a term synonymous with sycophant. Virginia Woolf maintained that, we remodel our psychological geography when we read Dickens, as he produces, characters who exist not in detail, not accurately or exactly, but abundantly in a cluster of wild yet extraordinarily revealing remarks. T. S. Eliot wrote that Dickens, excelled in character, in the creation of characters of greater intensity than human beings. 1. Character, vividly drawn throughout his novels as London itself. Dickens described London as a magic lantern, inspiring the places and people in many of his novels. From the coaching inns on the outskirts of the city to the lower reaches of the Thames, all aspects of the capital Dickens's London are described over the course of his body of work. Walking the streets particularly around London formed an integral part of his writing life, stoking his creativity. Dickens was known to regularly walk at least a dozen miles 19 kilometers per day, and once wrote, if I couldn't walk fast and far, I should just explode and perish. Dickens was the most popular novelist of his time, and remains one of the best known and most read of English authors. His works have never gone out of print, and have been adapted continually for the screen since the invention of cinema, with at least 200 motion pictures and TV adaptations based on Dickens's works documented. Many of his works were adapted for the stage during his own lifetime early productions included The Haunted Man which was performed in the West End's Adelphi Theatre in 1848 and, as early as 1901, the British silent film Scrooge, or, Marley's Ghost was made by Walter R. Booth. Contemporaries such as publisher Edward Lloyd cashed in on Dickens's popularity with cheap imitations of his novels, resulting in his own popular, Penny Dreadfuls. From the beginning of his career in the 1830s, Dickens's achievements in English literature were compared to those of Shakespeare. Dickens created some of the world's best-known fictional characters and is regarded by many as the greatest British novelist of the Victorian era. His literary reputation, however began to decline with the publication of Bleak House in 1852-53. Philip Collins calls Bleak House, a crucial item in the history of Dickens's reputation. Reviewers and literary figures during the 1850s, 1860s and 1870s, saw a drear decline, in Dickens, from a writer of, bright sunny comedy, to dark and serious social, commentary. The Spectator called Bleak House, a heavy book to read through at once, dull and wearisome as a serial, Richard Simpson, in The Rambler, characterized hard times as, this dreary framework, Fraser's magazine thought Little Dorrit, decidedly the worst of his novels. All the same, despite these, increasing reservations amongst reviewers and the chattering classes, the public never deserted its favorite. Dickens's popular reputation remained unchanged, sales continued to rise, and household words and later all the year round were highly successful.